On December 1st, 2021, Russia launched an aggressive attack against Tor's censorship circumvention methods, initiating a prolonged and high-stakes arms race between the Russian Federation and the Tor project that still continues to this day. We're going to see how various censorship resistance strategies from the Tor project often leaves nations with an ultimatum of collateral damage. In one of these cases, which we'll see later in the video, a seemingly negligent move caused Russia to accidentally block the entirety of Microsoft Azure hosted services for one day. There's been equally creative ways of censorship and censorship circumvention methods in other countries, such as China, Iran, and Turkmenistan. However, this video is going to discuss the battle in Russia. Most of the information in this video is sourced from various talks given by Roger Dingledine, one of the co-founders of the Tor project. He has excellent talks and tells great stories, so be sure to check them out if you're interested in learning more. Let's say that you're a citizen that wants to access information within a nation that censors various resources. Or, let's say that you're an activist or whistleblower, and you want to communicate with someone or something, but you want to do so privately. We know that you can use various tools to encrypt your traffic, but encryption is not enough. When the feds try to investigate things these days, they're not actually trying to break the encryption, but they're instead building a social graph of who you're talking to, how long you're talking for, what times you're talking, and more. Tor is an anonymity network built on distributed trust, designed not just to protect the contents of your communications, but also the metadata surrounding your communications. If you want to learn more about Tor, I would suggest watching my previous video on Tor. Before we take a look at the ongoing battle between Russia and the Tor project in more detail, let's begin with some foundational information. Tor is a network made up of nearly 10,000 Tor relays. All of these relays are publicly listed in a central directory. This means that if a country wants to block Tor, they can simply block the IP addresses of every single Tor relay. What the Tor project does to circumvent this is by having a pool of hidden, unlisted relays called bridges. If a user is in a region that blocks Tor relays, they would need to use one of these hidden Tor bridges to initially connect themselves to the Tor network. Once they're connected, they're able to use Tor normally. This creates a cat and mouse game where the Tor project needs to try and find a way to distribute these bridges to legitimate users one at a time, while keeping them hidden from sensors. Once a sensor becomes aware of a specific bridge, they will simply block it, just like the rest of the Tor relays. This method, where sensors try to block the IP addresses of relays and bridges, is just one way that sensors can try to block Tor. Another way is by using something called Deep Packet Inspection, known as DPI. With DPI, the sensor actually inspects internet traffic, all the way up to the application layer of the packet, and will attempt to block it based off the protocol. If they spot traffic that looks like Tor traffic, they will block it. Of course, it's no surprise that Tor tries to disguise its traffic in an attempt to blend in with regular, non-Tor internet traffic. Originally, Tor tried to make its traffic look like HTTPS web traffic, mimicking the Firefox browser talking to an Apache web server. The rationale here is something called collateral damage. If Tor is able to blend in with very important, widely used protocols, such as HTTPS traffic, the sensor would face an important question. If they want to block Tor, they could. However, this would require blocking all HTTPS traffic, which would cripple their own country's internet services. Essentially, collateral damage means that for countries to block Tor, they would also need to block some of their own operations. By attempting to make the price of this collateral damage as high as possible, Tor tries to make it not worth it to have these countries block them. Interestingly, in countries like China, this concept is actually becoming less effective in recent years, as a lot of traffic within China is contained within the country without leaving. This also doesn't work well for countries like Turkmenistan, who are willing to accept large amounts of collateral damage in order to persuade people into paying off the government to get access to an uncensored internet connection. Anyways, back to the story. It turns out that trying to exactly mimic Firefox plus Apache HTTPS traffic is actually quite difficult. Instead, the Tor project decided to split this issue into two parts. In addition to the Tor network itself, they created a concept of pluggable transports. 
These transports try to blend in, only dealing with reachability into the Tor network without getting blocked. Once you successfully connect to the Tor network, the Tor network itself deals with the rest. There's multiple different pluggable transports that actually work quite well, allowing citizens to access Tor in countries that try to block Tor. For example, one of them is called Ops 4. Ops 4 adds an additional layer of encryption on top of your regular Tor traffic, removing all recognizable headers. This means that when the sensor tries to do deep packet inspection, running a protocol classifier on internet traffic, they'll see a bunch of different protocols for various streams of traffic. But when it comes to Ops 4 traffic, the protocol classifier won't be able to make a determination, essentially outputting unknown protocol. Now, the sensor faces quite an important question. What do they do with all of the unknown protocols? Do they block all of them, or do they allow all of them? This is another important question of collateral damage. If they choose to block all of the unknown traffic, they will inadvertently block a bunch of not only obscure, but also newly developed protocols. However, if they choose to allow the unknown traffic, pluggable transports like Ops4 will allow users to successfully connect to Tor. This has proven to be quite a successful method of censorship circumvention, as a lot of countries are unwilling to block all unknown protocols due to the amount of disruption that it causes. Let's take a look at another interesting pluggable transport developed by the Tor project known as Snowflake. Snowflake disguises your traffic to look like WebRTC traffic, essentially making your Tor traffic look like video chat traffic, which is allowed in a lot of places. In addition to this, because Snowflake uses WebRTC, and browsers support WebRTC natively, you can actually download Snowflake as a browser extension in browsers like Chrome and Firefox. Due to the ease of this, there's actually a large variety of volunteers that get the Snowflake browser extension in order to help proxy traffic for users in regions that block Tor. This has helped Snowflake to become a very successful and widely used pluggable transport. In addition to Ops4 and Snowflake, Let's take a look at another pluggable transport known as Meek, which is based on a method known as domain fronting. Domain fronting is a method that can actually conceal the domain name of the service you're connecting to. Let's take a popular cloud service, such as AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud. With cloud services, we get into the realm of virtual hosting, where multiple different websites using multiple different domain names will be hosted on the same web server, possibly using only a single IP address for all of the underlying domains. Since multiple distinct domain names are being hosted on a server with only a single IP address, these domain names will actually resolve to the same IP address. In order for the server to distinguish what website the user is trying to reach, it will take a look at the HTTP host header, which will specify the domain name itself. Domain fronting is a technique that takes advantage of this. Let's say that you connect to a service over so HTTPS running on a popular cloud provider. The more popular the service, the better, as you need to pick a service that the sensor is unwilling to block. A lot of the time, content delivery networks, known as CDNs, are used for this, as significant chunks of the internet would not work properly if a sensor were to block popular CDNs. Essentially, many CDNs, especially JavaScript CDNs, are considered too big to fail. In this case, let's say that you open up an HTTPS connection to ajax.aspnetcdn.com, which is being hosted on Microsoft Azure. This means that ajax.aspnetcdn.com will be specified within the server name indicator or SNI field during the TLS handshake. Once you complete this TLS handshake, inside of the HTTPS encryption, you can now specify a different host header for the actual website that you want to reach. Since this is done inside of the HTTPS encryption, it will not be visible to the sensor. Essentially, you're using encryption to get to one domain that is allowed, but then reaching a different domain under the hood that is not allowed. Of course, both domains must be hosted on the same cloud service. From the sensor's perspective, all they see is that you're talking to a JavaScript CDN, but underneath, you're actually connecting to a Tor proxy that sends your traffic into the Tor network. However, it's worth noting that most major cloud providers disallowed domain fronting in recent years. At this point, we covered both bridges and pluggable transports. In short, bridges are unlisted Tor relays, 
serving as an entry point into the Tor network, and pluggable transports are techniques and software that attempt to disguise Tor traffic. In countries like Russia that block Tor, you would need to use both. You would use a pluggable transport to disguise your connection to a bridge, which would then serve as your entry point into the Tor network. Remember at the start of the video, when I said that the Tor project needs to find a way to distribute bridges to legitimate users that need them, without leaking them to sensors which would blacklist them? To accomplish this, they use something called BridgeDB. The rationale here is that users need to provide some scarce resource in exchange for a bridge. For example, they tend to require a unique IP address block, or unique Gmail account, among other techniques. The game of trying to distribute bridges to users without letting the sensor learn all of them is in and of itself its own topic, which we'll see more of shortly. This brings us to the arms race between Russia and the Tor project. In December 2021, all in a single day, Russia blocked all public Tor relays, they blocked domain fronting with Meek, which was set up to work with Azure, they blocked all of the OBS4 bridges they could find, including the ones that were supposed to be more difficult to find, and they blocked Snowflake. One week later, the Tor project received a legal notice from the Russian government, letting them know that they would block torproject.org, and shortly after, it was blocked. The data shows a stark decline in direct connections to public Tor relays, and a corresponding increase in bridge users. There's a lot that went into these blocks, but one of the most interesting parts is how they blocked the Meek domain fronting method. Domain fronting at the time was set up to use Microsoft Azure, specifically a Microsoft JavaScript CDN known as ajax.aspnetcdn.com. If they actually would have blocked this domain, this would have stopped a significant chunk of the internet from working, as this is a very common CDN used on websites throughout the internet to load in JavaScript. After looking into what actually happened, they realized that they did not block this domain, they actually blocked the IP address that this domain resolves to. You might be thinking, big deal. Why would it matter if they block the domain or the IP? They're blocking the CDN either way. But actually, this makes a huge difference. You see, Azure does something that most large services do, called GeoDNS. GeoDNS actually lets DNS queries to given domain names resolve to different IP addresses based off where in the world the DNS query was sent from. This is mainly done for performance reasons. For instance, if a user in North America types google.com into their search bar, it will resolve to an IP address for a Google server in North America. However, if a user in Asia types google.com into their search bar, Despite being the same domain name, it will actually resolve to an IP address of a Google server in Asia. In fact, they also get multiple different services within a single provider to resolve to the same IP address of an Edge server that receives all initial traffic and then routes it internally. You see, the IP address that ajax.aspnetcdn.com resolves to isn't just for the specific domain, but actually for all Azure services. Since Russia blocked this IP, they actually inadvertently ended up blocking all Azure services being accessed within the region of Russia. After about a day, Microsoft took note and ended up changing this region's IP. Russia did not end up blocking the new IP. Just two days after Russia's initial block, on December 3rd, a long and detailed forum post would be published to the Tor community, severely undermining Russia's attempt to block Tor. You see, it turns out that Russia only blocked the main Tor website, called torproject.org, not the forum, which is being hosted on forum.torproject.net at the time. This post, which was published in both Russian and English, explained exactly what happened, and included detailed steps for Russian users on how to circumvent the block and request bridges, which was seen by hundreds of thousands of people. This post included instructions on how to use both OBS4 and Snowflake, as the Tor project was quickly able to bring both of these pluggable transports back into a working state. Snowflake was an easy fix, which was pushed out a few days after the initial block. When it came to OBS4, which requires OBS4 bridges to be distributed to users, they took quite an interesting approach to hide new bridges from being blacklisted by Russia. This new distribution system was actually a Telegram bot, called Get Bridges Bot, that distributes bridges to anyone that requests them. So, what stops the Russian government from creating a bunch of Telegram accounts and requesting a bunch of bridges? 
It turns out that Telegram account IDs are assigned numerically. This means that you can know roughly how old a Telegram account is based off its account ID. The Tor project simply divided their bridges up into two pools. It would assign bridges from one pool to older accounts, and bridges from the other pool to newer accounts. Sure enough, Russia created a bunch of brand new Telegram accounts, and blocked all of the new bridges. However, the bridges assigned to the old Telegram accounts actually evaded blocks for several months, proving this to be quite an effective strategy. The Tor project was actually able to cooperate with a Russian operative on the inside, who revealed some interesting information about how these bridges were being blocked. Let's hear it from Roger himself. And also I should mention uh, the importance of having people on the inside who want to tell you what's going on. We got some interesting communications from folks who, run, who work in the censorship ministry in Russia. And I don't want to write any, yes, excellent. And I don't want to write any of the words up there because I don't want somebody using stylometry or something to guess uh, which employee that was. But they were telling us interesting stories like, uh, my job is to uh, download Tor Browser and get bridges each day. And when I get a, a bridge, I put it in a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet and I email it to the censors. So this is, that's the world that they're living in. If you're imagining some sort of high-tech automated thing, uh, that was not what was going on in 2021, 2022 uh, in Russia. And I think that's still the case. Now, all of this started in December 2021. Fast forward two years to November 2023, and reports start to come out that financial institutions within Russia are actually working with the government to investigate people who use their bank accounts or credit cards to pay for VPN services. Thankfully, these bridges and pluggable transport still seem to be working for those inside the country, which of course are all free of charge, thanks to donations and efforts to host relays and bridges by volunteers all around the world. This video only discussed specific events that took place in Russia starting in December 2021, however, there are equally interesting stories taking place in other countries around the world. I think it's fascinating to take a look at these games of cat and mouse on both the sides of censorship and censorship resistance. I'll close with one final thought. Even though it looks like in a lot of cases, the Tor project is able to use these bridges and pluggable transports to successfully come out ahead in the censorship arms race, there's something else to consider. Each time a censor does something in an attempt to block Tor, it forces users to adapt. They need to learn more about bridges and transports instead of just using Tor normally, and they need to stay up to date with new developments, patches, and updates in order to adapt. For example, there was a temporary issue with Snowflake in September of 2023, and despite the Tor project successfully restoring its functionality, the amount of Snowflake users didn't make a full recovery. In other words, each step the sensor takes causes the users to be burdened, even if the Tor project pulls out ahead. So, it's not just a game of winning the arms race, but it's actually also a game of slowing down the pace of the arms race as well. A lot of people wanted me to make more Tor-related content, which is why I made this video. If you'd like to see more similar content, or have any ideas for future content, please let me know in the comments. If you've made it this far, you might be interested in subscribing to the channel and checking out some of my other content. And as always, thanks for watching.